Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap, my name is Pixlorifs, our writer's low XP captions on this video were provided by Liara, and it's been a great week on Hermitcraft if you're an eldritch boss monster bent on the destruction of the overworld and its inhabitants. <laughs> oh, this is, this is not good. It was not- Did anybody bring lava? We only see one such cryptid captured on camera this week, although it has multiplied to an absurd degree thanks to DocM's shenanigans with warden-based mob switches, but Twitter activity heavily implies that Good Times with Scar may have showed up to his dragon enclosure to find a broken leash and a dragon-shaped hole in the nearest everything. How will Hermitcraft recover from the attack of the world's worst edit eraser ever? We don't know yet, but for now let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Oh, baby. You know, we built the horse race speed ups and we yes. never even raced each other. It's, we, a, it's a real shame. We didn't. <laughs> we didn't. No. I think I got first place on that. Starting with another known cryptid, XB Crafted, who has made it his task to herd much more mundane creatures. His petting zoo got its ravages last week, and now it needs things which won't kill him on contact. So he's planning an aviary to house a bunch of parrots, and for the sake of transparency, he's using glass. Although there are some chain link fence segments, so your kids still have the opportunity to lose a finger. And so the, the thought behind the iron bars is twofold, right? Uh, I don't have any iron bars. Uh, it helps with air circulation. Is it gives little kids a place to stick their fingers like they're not supposed to and then get bit by a freaking or pecked or bit, whatever. Surprisingly for a collection which includes two destructive illager beasts, the real troublemakers are the goats. Borrowed on permanent loan from DocM's starter base, the new kids on the block immediately breach containment and even start a jailbreak for the neighboring pigs. And they're screamers. So, you know, there's there's the thing. But that's a pretty minor incident given how Wells Knight has ransacked Doc M for an entire town. Not wholly interested in his early season farm, Doc lets Wells build his chateau over the random village they both invaded, which really only reminds Wells Knight that he himself doesn't actually have the many farms and conveniences most players have amassed in the meantime. I don't even really have a proper storage room yet, but since Doc is okay with us taking over this area, I think that is exactly what we're going to do. What he does have is a burning need to hold the top spot in every elytra course available on the server, of which there's now two. Azum avoids one and the one false symmetry has been chipping away at for a few weeks now. So if you're interested in seeing the tower, go watch False's video. It's our most recent one as of the time that I'm recording this clip. And, you know, with the way that I do things, who knows? Maybe she'll have another video out in the meantime. Unfortunately, only X's one is operational. And even then, it might try to squish you with anvils for daring to actually read the rules. I guess the other page is at the end, huh? <laughs> you missed me. I'm guessing that was probably Doc. The funniest bit about it is what the comments were very kind to point out, that Azuma's drop trap would not actually work in its original state. The whole ordeal relied on a sign being popped off by a piston, and you can't push a sign with a piston in Java Minecraft. You can pull the blockets on though, so that's a quick fix that leaves iJevin more squished than he probably deserved. That's actually a false statement, seeing how Jevin lately could use that good Patreon support death hug. The fear of posting videos, and that's probably gonna sound absurd. It does sound a little absurd, to be honest with you, but really, um, it, that's the truth. I think my biggest mistake in the past couple of years is not exploring different types of videos. I, um, I really want to start making different types of content. His latest video dives into the burnouts and general wobbliness of being a Minecraft YouTuber in the scene for the last couple of years but we'd be remiss not to mention that he'll be putting his Patreon supporters into the catacombs under the castle. Kindness begets kindness, and in-game Jevin does donate a whole pile of material to Etho for whatever Ethonian need he requires. That's all cool, I cool. needed. <laughs> Thanks, man. Here, also, have a carpet. Bye. And now require he does, what with his project spanning several biomes. He and Rendog actually showcase their cool boat race to a zoom avoid, and good thing he's already wearing two helmets, the track does go really fast in places. <laughs> zombies on the track, look out everybody. Oh no! Oh we got zombies! Kill him Efo, kill him! <laughs> we got zombies! No. This actually comes just before Azuma gets to fix his own ice tray machine, the prolonged floating river that's perpetually packed down by a flying piston machine. The final shape of it lends itself quite nicely to a bridge structure, which Azuma turns it into after trying out a few pallets in World Edit. Though bridges generally got a lead somewhere, and this one ending mid-air, we choose to see it as more of a long balcony. More in the art of Minecraft 3D printing, X had to figure out a stone generator that combines several ones into a single but very quickly regenerating slab. 
That was the only way to make it keep up with the Guardians raining from above and dying to generate Skulk. But now we can fire up the machine and destroy the Skulk blocks and they will get practically instantly replaced. <laughs> this feels almost faster than on the test world that you saw a moment ago. Look at this. Azuma isn't the only one dealing with frosty conditions. Joe Hill spends a while shoveling the last winter snow from his driveway while sharing all his stories from a brief trip to visit his fiancée in England, including trying a half-English breakfast, meeting zombie Cleo, and that one time an entire comedy club found out that he plays Minecraft for a living. You know, so uh, what's your name? What do you do? And then, like, cracking a few jokes about, So, Joe, what do you do for a living? And I said, uh, I play video games. And she just looks at the, go, turns to the rest of the audience and goes, I knew he was too good to be true. Well, not like, not in the accent. Dang, I'm trying, I can't, I apologize. From there, things kind of got a little bit off the rails. The first signs of spring are showing thanks to swapping some of those mangrove roots out for pink concrete powder and glazed terracotta. The snow all goes over to Decked Out for help with decorating, and that's where Azuma pops back up to introduce him to a Psycraft snow machine that'll produce enough snowballs for another ice age. Do you know the tricks for um, getting the game to think you're holding down click? Oh, well, so I have a roll of tape that's heavy enough that I can just put it on the mouse button. I'm not actually using the adhesive part of the tape, just the weight, but it is basically taping down the button. Alrighty. Joe continues to clean up, although that's harder to do on the TCG court when you play a speedrunner deck, but the resources left at spawn are easy affair, and in true civic-minded fashion, he just dumps it all around the back of his local amusement park. Despite meeting them in person, Joe isn't the only person to see Human Cleo this week, because Vintage Beef has continued his Alter Ego's expansion pack to include a Human Cleo card alongside season favourite Hot Guy. But I wanted to work in conjunction with the bow card, because... bow. <laughs> well, not just because of that. These cards won't be in circulation quite yet, in fact they may even be the prize for the upcoming TCG tournament. In the interests of balance, a few tournament rules will come into effect, notably a limit on the amount of rare and ultra-rare cards per deck. Also, Mumbo might be banned, although we should clarify we mean the card, not the man himself. Beef even plays a game against Doc M's prankster deck to see how powerful the Mumbo card is when used right. Randog fares a little better against Doc with his new Redstoner deck, although Doc may have been nerfed a little by agreeing to match Ren's amount of ultra-rare cards. Oh god, yeah, I remember yeah. that day when we rolled that card. Was <laughs> you did good. It was good. Your world eater people are asking that to be banned. I don't think that needs to be banned. Why? I know, it's a good card. It's Together they discover Cub Fan's Pyramid Arena has special effects, and when the first game comes down to the wire, they agree to a best of three that will play out in bonus episodes. With the TCG Championship drawing close, Cubfan135 retightens the mechanisms at his Pyramid Arena and redoubles his efforts in mastering the cards. Look, his headphones broke, so he can't hear your pleas for mercy, okay? My headphones recently fell apart, split in two, and I'm using currently different headphones, so let me know if things sound a little bit different or if they sound the same. Some people against my mixtape, aka the fire resistance. They also win the MCC championship again, you know, just as a side note. Also, you may notice I have a new skin on, and believe it or not guys, we actually won MCC 29. So we are once again an MCC champion. This is our second MCC victory. In the same vein, Decked Out 2 seems to be inching closer to its completion, or at least to the QA testing phase, which is really just the throw a ZF at it repeatedly phase. And then I'm gonna get ZF. He has volunteered to be my guinea pig. We're getting close. My goal right now is to make level one completely playable. The newest and important level design is Tango adding an honest to God difficulty slider at the beginning of the dungeon. Before even entering the frostbitten catacombs, you can select the level of punishment you want to go in for, but keep in mind that it will also affect the value of loot you'll be getting. Of that loot, there's some important changes too. Treasure coins from before can now be crafted up into crowns, crowns can be traded for gear later, and Tango is even playing around with the idea that some cards for the game should be craftable, using materials found once again in the dungeon. Yeah, that's right. So basically some of the higher end cards, the legendaries and the rares, I'm going to reserve to a crafting system, I think, where instead of paying for frost embers, find the recipe somewhere in the dungeon. Uh, but if you do and you take it to the crafting bench, there will only be one in the final room. You can craft a card that you can add to your deck. 
Also, between the riches of chests, you will certainly want to find a dungeon key, because this is the only way to open the door to the next level of the event. We have to especially shout out the tutorial sign Tango left for this mechanic, which simply says, Seek the key, offer it to the kneeling man. To which we can only say, Don't give up, skeleton. Doc M gets mechanical at his own arena, although he's just making a carbon copy of the existing TCG venues. With extra carbon, in this case, because all the building blocks are deep slate diamond ore. And he wants the bling on display, so he adds in a glass floor, making it like one of those translucent PlayStation controllers where you can see the circuit boards. But at the end of that, he's down to his last couple of shulkers of diamond ore, and he's so committed to the bit that he builds a tunnel board to acquire more of it. And to avoid the mob spawning issues inherent to digging at the lowest point of the world, he decides to bring 80 plus wardens along for the ride. Somewhere along the way, Doc gets killed when a flying machine is doing its thing, and that's how we get Doc, Beef, Joe, B-Dubs and XB crafted, trying to take down about 20 wardens on the nether roof. Eventually the menace is contained, but Doc M is still free to roam and stock up on diamond ore again. Oh come on! Oh what god, watch out, he's gonna shoot! Oh my goodness! <laughs> Healing I'm potion! Lost. Healing potion! I told you they were coming handy. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll kite him. You guys just keep hitting him. We can probably hit him with our swords as well. Oh, he's coming for me now! He's not the only one who can flash his cash around. B00's shops have been raking in a tidy profit, which is why he's a little embarrassed that the top of his base is currently a mess. But that's nothing a little construction equipment can't fix, so the crane goes in, probably so he can haul all his shulker boxes up there for Etho to give him a pop quiz about. Or... <laughs> I was wondering, like, I'm looking at there's there's no category here whatsoever, but somehow you made a category for yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, two stacks. That's my two, two stacks, stacks of glass, yeah, two yeah. stacks of terracotta. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Turns out the real reason Etho is there is to challenge him to a horse race, which at the time of writing has already happened, but no spoilers until next week. In the meantime, B-Dub spoils us with one heck of a build, finishing the exterior of the base, and it turns out the trick to breaking the Hermitcraft curse of not building the back of your build is to have lots of builds all facing outwards. You complete a big build, a big project, that feeling of accomplishment after, oh baby, there's not much better. He crowns the whole thing with a hologram of his own face, which can be seen from both Scarland and the shopping district, in case you're wondering who would build with all that diorite. That's a good view from the shopping district, even if it gets blocked, it's whatever. I just didn't want it to be an eyesore. And finally, there's Mumbo, who you may remember turned all his diamond ore into a server's worth of diamonds. But now he's dismantled Grian's, uh, interior decorations and stylized the inside of the vault himself. He finds himself in a bemusing situation. What does the richest hermit do with all that hard cash? From And despite my best efforts to give them back to the other hermits, well, nobody, nobody actually took them. Nobody accepted the lost diamond. He tries giving it away to Scar, who in return gives him popcorn, balloons, and a heart attack. <laughs> Scar? How did you do that? He tries throwing them away to see if they spark joy as they ignite in lava. He even creates a redstone contraption to give them out very infrequently under an anonymous road in the shopping district. But finally, after working on his storage area, he puts a lot of them on display under a glass floor. I mean, it feels wrong, but I think in the context of a vault, it kind of makes sense. And he hasn't forgotten there's a giant diagram of his base behind the vault, so even if he doesn't want to construct that himself, he can afford to get the builders in. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is XP, and my name is PixelRiffs. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.